The Giver by Lewis Lowry, Chapter One. Mother? There was no reply. She hadn't expected one. Her mother had been dead now for four days, and Kira could tell that the last of her spirit was drifting away. Mother. She said it again, quietly, to whatever was leaving. She thought that she could feel its leave-taking, the way one could feel a, a small whisper of breeze at night. Now she was all alone. Kira felt the aloneness, the uncertainty, and a great sadness. This had been her mother, the warm and vital important woman whose name had been Katrina. Then after the brief and unexpected sickness, it had become the body of Katrina, still containing the lingering spirit. After four sunsets and sunrises, the spirit too was gone. It was simply a body. The diggers would come and sprinkle a layer of soil over the flesh, but even so it would be eaten by the clawing, hungry creatures that came at night. Then their bones would scatter, rot, and crumble to become part of the earth. So in this first start of the chapter, um, what we have is we have the first character, Kira, and her mother has just died, Katrina. And in this society, in this community, when you die, you uh, go somewhere and you sit with the body and the body, you know, has four days, four sunrises and four sunsets. And then the spirit of the body leaves as well. Then these people come and they put some, uh, some soil, some of the ground on top of the body. And at night, some kind of creatures come out and they eat the body. Kira wiped briefly at her eyes, which had suddenly filled with tears. She had loved her mother and would miss her terribly, but it was time for her to go. She wedged her walking stick in the soft ground, leaned on it and pulled herself up. So Kira, the young girl, uses a stick to help her walk. This will be important. She looked around uncertainly, not sure what to do. She was young still and had not experienced death before, not in the small two-person family that she and her mother had been. Of course, she had seen others go through the rituals, through the ceremony. She could see some of them in the fast, foul-smelling field of leaving, huddled beside the ones whose lingering spirits they tended, they looked after. She knew that a woman named Helena was there, watching the spirit leave her infant, who had been born too soon, a baby. Helena had come to the field only the day before. Infants, babies, did not require the four days of watching. The wisps of their spirits barely arrived, so they drifted away quickly. So Helena would return to the village and her family soon. So she recognised other people in the field of leaving. As for Kira, she had no family now, nor any home. The cot, the place she lived, she had shared with her mother, had been burned. This was always done after sickness. The small structure, the only home Kira had ever known, was gone. She had seen the smoke in the distance as she sat with the body of her mother. As she watched the spirit of her mother drift and leave the body, she had seen the cindered fragments of her childhood life whirl into the sky as well. She felt a small shudder of fear. Fear was always part of life for the people. Because of fear, being scared of things, they made shelter and found food and grew things like food. For the same reason, weapons were stored, waiting. There was fear of cold, of sickness and hunger. There was fear of beasts. And fear propelled her now as she stood, leaning on her stick. She looked down a last time at the lifeless body that had once contained her mother, and considered and thought about where to go. Kira thought about rebuilding, building the house. If she could find help, though help was unlikely, it wouldn't take her long to build a cot especially not this time of year, summer start, when tree limbs were supple and mud was thick and abundant beside the river. She had often watched other building, others building, and Kira realised that she could probably construct, build some sort of shelter for herself, a place to stay. Its corners and chimney might not be straight. The roof would be difficult because her bad leg made it almost impossible for her to climb, but she would find a way. Somehow she would build a cot. Then she would find a way to make a life. Her mother's brother, so her uncle, had been near her in the field for two days, not guarding Katrina, his sister, but sitting silently beside the body of his own woman, the short-tempered Solora, and that of their new baby infant who had been born 
who had been too young to have a name. They had nodded to each other, Kira and her mother's brother, her uncle, in acknowledgement, recognizing each other. But he had departed, his time in the field of leaving finished. He had tykes to tend. He and Solora had two others in addition to the one that had brought about her death, babies, tykes being babies. The others were still small, the names yet of one syllable, Dan and Ma. Perhaps I could care for them, take care of them, Kira thought briefly, trying to find her own future within the village. But even as the thought flickered within her, she knew that it would not be permitted, not allowed. Solora's tykes babies would be given away, distributed to those who had none. Healthy, strong tykes were valuable, properly trained. They could contribute to family needs and would be greatly desired. No one would desire Kira. No one would want Kira. No one ever had wanted her, except for her mother. Often Katrina had told Kira the story of her birth, the birth of a fatherless girl with a twisted leg and how her mother had fought to keep her alive. They came to take you, Katrina said, whispering the story to her in the evening in their cot, with the fire fed and glowing. You were one day old, not named your one-syllable infant name, Kir. Yes, that's right, Kir. They brought me food and they were going to take you away to the field. Kira shuddered, shivered. It was the way, the custom, and it was the merciful, the right thing to do to give an unnamed, imperfect infant back to the earth before its spirit had filled it and made it human. But it made her shudder. Katrina stroked her daughter's hair. They meant no harm, she reminded her. Kira nodded. They didn't know it was me. It wasn't you yet. Tell me again why you told them no, Kira whispered. Her mother sighed, remembering. I knew I would not have another child, she pointed out. Your father had been taken by beasts. It had been several months since he went off to hunt and did not return. And so I would not give birth again. Oh, she added, perhaps they would have given me one eventually, an orphan to raise, someone without parents. But as I held you, even then with your spirit not yet arrived and with your leg bent wrong so that it was clear you would never run, even then your eyes were bright. I could see the beginning of something remarkable, amazing in your eyes. And your fingers were long and well-shaped and strong. My hands were strong, Kira added with satisfaction, happiness. She had heard the story so often, so many times. Each time of hearing, she looked down at her strong hands with pride, proud of her hands. Her mother laughed. So strong, they gripped my own thumb fiercely and would not let go. Feeling that fierce tug on my thumb, I could not let them take you away. I simply told them no. They were angry. Yes, but I was firm. I was strong. And of course, my father was still alive. He was older then, four syllables, and he had been the leader of the people, the chief guardian for a long time. They respected him. And your father would have been a greatly respected leader too, had he not died on the long hunt. He had already been chosen to be a guardian. Say my father's name to me, Kira begged. Her mother smiled in the firelight. Christopher, she said. You know that. I like to hear it, though. I like to hear you say it. Do you want me to go on? Kira nodded. You were firm. You insisted, she reminded her mother. Still, they made me promise that I would not become a burden. I haven't, have I? A burden is when you bring everyone down, where your life... Uh, makes other people's lives difficult. You are a sturdy, uh, sorry, of course not. Your strong hands and intelligence, your wise head, make up for the crippled leg. So at the moment, just to summarize what we've read so far, there's a girl named Kira. Her mother died, so she went to the field of leaving for four days and four nights. When she was there, she saw other people. Now she's remembering the times when her mother would tell her about her father, okay? You are a sturdy and reliable helper in the weaving shed. All the women who work there say so. One bent leg, one messed up leg, is of no importance when measured against your cleverness, your intelligence. The stories you tell to the tykes, the pictures you create with words and with thread. The threading you do, like sewing, which is, I think is sombra. It is unlike any threading the people have ever seen, far beyond anything I could do, her mother stopped. She laughed. 
Enough. You mustn't tease me into flattery. Don't forget that you are still a girl and often willful. And just this morning, Kira, you forgot to tidy the cot, the house, even though you had promised. I won't forget tomorrow, Kira said sleepily, snuggling against her mother on the raised sleeping mat. She pushed her twist. She pushed her twisted leg into a more comfortable position for the night. I promise. But now there was no one to help her. She had no family left, and she was not a particularly useful person in the village. Remember, in this village, in this community, if you're different or if you have problems, they don't want you. Remember, Kira's leg is twisted; she can't walk properly. For everyday work, Kira helped in the weaving shed, picking up the scraps and leavings. But her twisted leg diminished her value as a labourer, and even in the future, as a mate, someone to have babies. Yes, the woman liked the fanciful stories that she told to amuse restless babies, tykes, and they admired the little threadings that she made. But those things were diver diversions; they were not work. The sky with the sun no longer overhead, but sending shadows now into the field of leaving from the trees and thorn bushes at its edge, told her that it was long past midday, twelve o'clock. In her uncertainty, she had lingered here too long. Carefully, she gathered the skins on which she had slept these four nights, guarding her mother's spirits. Her fire was cold ashes, a blackened smudge. Her water container was empty, and she had no more food. So she's just finishing the four days ceremony、uh, in the field of leaving with her mother. Slowly, using her stick, she limped. She walked toward the path that led back to the village, holding on to a small hope that she still might be welcome there. Tykes played at the edge of the clearing, scampering about on the moss-covered ground. Pine needles stuck into their naked bodies and in their hair. She smiled. She recognized each little one. There was the yellow-haired son of her mother's friend. She remembered his birth two summers ago, and the girl whose twin had died. She was younger than the yellow-haired one, just toddling. But she giggled and shrieked with the others, playing "Catch me while I'm running." Tussling, the toddlers slapped and kicked at each other, grabbing toy sticks, flailing with their small fists. Kira remembered watching her childhood companions at such play, preparing for the real scramble of adult life. Unable to participate because of her broken, her flawed leg, she had watched from the sidelines with envy. So she's walking home and she sees all these little babies、uh, fighting, and it reminds her of when she was younger, but she wasn't playing with anyone because her leg was bad. An older child, a dirty-faced boy of eight or nine years old, still too young for puberty and the two-syllable name that he would receive, looked over at her from the place where he was clearing underbrush and sorting twigs into the bundle for fire starting. So she sees another boy, eight or nine years old, that's、uh, doing some cleaning. Remember, in this community as well, your name tells you how old you are. So when Kira was born, she was just named Kir. Then when she got to nine or ten, she became Kira. And so on. It was Matt who had always been her friend. She liked Matt. He lived in the swampy, disagreeable fen, probably the child of a dragger or digger. But he ran freely through the village with his disorderly friends. His dog always at his heels. So this is Matt. Matt's the son of someone maybe who digs or builds things, and he's always dirty. Often he stopped, as now, to do some chore or small job in return for a few coins or for a candy, for a sweet. Kira called a greeting to the boy. The dog's bent tail, matted with twigs and leaves, thumped on the ground, and the boy grinned in reply. "So you be back from the field," he said. "What's it like there? Scared was you? Did creatures come at night?" Kira shook her head and smiled. Younger one-syllable types were not allowed in the field, so it was natural that Matt would be curious and a little in awe. "No creatures," she reassured him. "I had fire, and it kept them away." So Katrina be gone now from her body," he asked in his dialect, the way he speaks. People from the Fen were oddly different. So the Fen is an area, and these people don't speak normally. Always identifiable by their strange speech and crude manners, they were looked down upon by most people, but not by Kira. She was very fond of Matt. So the people from the Fen that speak differently, people in her village in Kira's village, they don't like them. They think that they're, you know, poor and corroncho, I guess. But she likes Matt. She nodded. 
My mother's spirit has gone, she acknowledged. I watched it leave her body. It was like mist. It drifted away. Matt came over to her, still carrying an armful of twigs of branches from a tree. He squinted at her ruefully and wrinkled his nose. Your cot is horrid burnt, he told her. Her house is, is burnt. Kira nodded. She knew that her home had been destroyed, though she secretly, though secretly she had hoped she was wrong, mistaken. Yes, she sighed. And everything in it, my frame, did they burn my threading frame? Matt frowned. I tried to save things, but it's mostly all burnt. Just your cot, Kira. Not like when there's a big sickness. This time it just be your mum. I know, Kira sighed again. In the past, there had been sicknesses that spread from one cot from one house to the next with many deaths. When that happened, a huge burning would take place, followed by a rebuilding that became almost festive with the noise of workers smearing wet mud over the fitted wooden sides of new structures, methodically slapping it into smoothness. The charred smell of the burning would remain in the air even as the new cots were built, Rose. So when there's a big sickness in the village, they burn every house and then they re rebuild them again using mud and wood. But today there was no festivity, no celebration. There were only the usual sounds. Katrina's death, Kira's mother's death, Katrina, had changed nothing in the lives of the people. She had been there, now she was gone. Their lives continued. With the boy still beside her, Kira paused at the well and filled her container with water. Everywhere she heard arguing, the cadence of bickering was constant sound in the village. The harsh remarks of men vying for power. The shrill bragging and taunting of women of one another, envious of one another and irritable with the tykes who whined, who cried and whimpered at their feet and were frequently kicked out of the way. So life is normal there. Okay, so she goes back to the village. Uh, she has no family. She has no home. And she hears the usual things in the village. Men arguing women bragging and talking about one another and the babies crying everywhere, the tykes. She cupped, she put her hand over her eyes and squinted against the afternoon sign, sun to find the gap where her own house, her cot had been. She took a deep breath. <sighs> it would be a long walk to gather saplings and a hard chore to dig the mud by the river bank. So it'd be difficult for her to, to rebuild her house. The corner timbers would be heavy to lift and hard to drag, the big pieces of trees that she needs. I have to start building, she told Matt, who still held a bundle of twigs in his scratched and dirty arms. Do you want help? It could be fun if there were two of us. I can't pay you, but I'll tell you some new stories, she added. The boy shook his head. I be whipped if and if I don't finish the fire twiggies. So he'll be punished. He turned away. After a hesitation, he turned back to Kira and said in a low voice, I heard them talking. They don't want you should stay. They be planning to turn you out. Now your mum be dead. They be set on putting you in the field for the beasts. They talk about having draggers take you. Kira felt her stomach tighten with fear, but she tried to keep her voice calm. She needed information from Matt and it would make him wary to know she was frightened. Who's they? She asked in an annoyed, superior tone. So Matt, the boy from the friend, the village, the part of the village that people don't think people are nice, is telling Kira that they're actually going to try and take her to the beasts, the field for the beasts, because they want her to die. They don't want her in the village anymore. Them woman, he replied. I heard them talking at the well. I'd be picking up wood chippies from the refuse and them didn't even notice me listening but they want your space. They want where your cot, where your house was. They aim, they aim to build a pen there to keep the tykes and the fowls enclosed so they don't be having to chase them all the time. So they want to take that place where her house was. Kira stared at him. It was terrifying, almost unbelievable. The casualness of the cruelty. In order to pen their disobedient toddlers and chickens, the woman would turn her out of the village to be devoured and eaten by the beasts that waited in the woods to forage the field. Whose was the strongest voice against me? She asked for a moment. Matt thought he moved and shifted the twigs in his hands and Kira could see that he was reluctant to get involved in her problems and fearful of his own life, his own fate. But he had always been her friend. 
Finally, looking around first to be certain he wouldn't be overheard, that no one was listening, he told her the name of the person with whom Kira would have to do battle. Vanderer, he whispered. It came as no surprise. Nonetheless, Kira's heart sank. So that's the end of chapter one. I know it might be a little bit confusing, but I'm just going to quickly remind everyone what happened. So Kira is a young girl who has a bad leg. In this village, they have different rules. If you are not normal, they want to take you away to get you killed. They think that you're not going to be useful. And so Kira was born with a bad leg. Now her mother, Katrina, and her father, Christopher, were very important people in the village, okay, before her father disappeared. So they let them keep the baby, which was Kira. Now, many years later, Kira doesn't have a father. The father was taken by beasts when he was hunting. He never returned. And the mother just died from a sickness. Now, Kira is all alone and she doesn't know what to do. She has no home because they burned her house down with fire because that's what happens when someone's sick. Then she's going back from the field of leaving where she spent four days and four nights next to her mother's body because now the beasts come out and they eat the bodies. So she's going home and she sees her friend Matt. Matt tells her that they're going to try and kick her out of the village because they want the area where her house used to be. So she's been told that this lady, that this girl from the village, um, whose name is Vandara, wants to kill, kick her out. So, so now Kira knows she's going to have to fight to, to stay alive in this village. That's the end.